you mentioned a, a second edition of the book, which leads to what would be the, if, if you continue, what are the additional questions, or if any, or the additional areas mm -hmm. that you would probe in these people? Well, you know, we ended the interviews in 2012, and we just uh, uh, finished the book uh, around the end of 2013. And um, what happened in that, in that period, even in that one year, but certainly a couple years before that, was the growth of the idea of humanist communities. And if I could go back and, and do more interviews, I would ask that. I would ask the pastors, what do you think about the idea of, of moving your same people that you have in such a way incrementally so that you could stay in your church, you could take the cross down and, uh, and have a humanist community? Because when I was doing the interviews, it was how can I manage to stay in this and maintain my, uh, my own sense of, um, of honesty or what can I do to get out of this? Mm -hmm. I, I wish I would, had been able to ask them or knew to ask them uh, what would they do if they had options besides uh, making compromises to stay in. Uh, the, the clergy or to find some way to get out and still be able to make a living. And uh, if I had suggested to them that they, could, could they imagine staying in um, and saying that they didn't believe in God, that they didn't believe in supernaturalism, but they did believe in community and they thought they believed in a lot of the good things of Christianity, the lot of, a lot of the teachings of Jesus and people like Jesus, um, would they would that be attractive to them? Um, how do they see something like that happening? And just to uh, kind of explore their imagination. Could you go back and talk about some of the conflict that this created in their family lives? I've come across a number of ministers in, in my area is Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. I'm in a very, I live in a very conservative area. And ministers who have become atheists still have congregations and part of the problem is their wives, their children, their extended family, they may come from families of ministers, um, that th there's a lot more tension and pain around the, the family issues and, and even the marital issues. Mm -hmm. And could you say something about that? Yeah, that really made all the difference for people. That made it easier for people to stay in some of these liberal pastors to stay in if their wives had similar attitudes about religion. Um, if there was a marital conflict around religion, it made it extremely difficult. And I'm thinking of one person in the study whose his name was Adam. He was in the first study. He was one of the original um, five people. His wife was still a strong believer. She knew exactly how he felt. He had over time been able to tell her. Over time his children got older and he was able to be more straightforward with them. Um, and the big problem was his, his wife. He, they were still in love with each other. His, uh, he wanted to stay in the same community uh, because he had friends in the community and his children were in school there. Um, and it, it's, a, it, it's a difficult situation that doesn't get better. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen that in the few examples mm -hmm. I've had. And again, it seems to me, along the lines that you wrote about, that the, these were men, mm -hmm. and they had been exposed to the, in a sense, the, the history mm -hmm. in seminary. But their wives and family were only exposed to and were deep believers because of just mm -hmm. the devotional mm -hmm. aspects. It, was that what you picked up in your interviews? That it, again, the, the men had lost their uh, belief in seminary, but their families had not been exposed to the same kind of things that would have triggered the doubt. Yes, but that didn't happen all the time. What happened often was the wife along the way would uh, either learn from the husband or learn on their own. I mean, there's lots of ways to learn about this. You don't have to go to seminary. I, you know, I didn't learn it in seminary. A lot of people just have just a lot of people just don't buy it from the beginning. There's one instance where uh, the the wife of the um, the minister um, didn't really believe much herself from the very beginning. She married this guy because she loved him, and didn't particularly like the fact that he was a minister. But it didn't interfere with their marriage. She didn't mind, you know, that he believed this, 
And as his beliefs changed, it actually made their, their marriage better. So it, it, it make, it's a very individual thing. One of the implications of this is, or at least one of the messages is, it's going to be very individual. And it's mm -hmm. going to be looking deeply at the particular people that are caught in these bonds. Yeah. And, and that they can come to doubt in various ways. It, it can affect mm -hmm. their families negatively and positively. Yeah. And the nature of how they're stuck in their congregation can vary uh, dramatically. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the other ways that these individuals would lose their faith? One of the ones you really emphasize is that it starts in seminary. Mm -hmm. But what were the other influences on them? The ones that the, the, the faith seemed to mm -hmm. either be shattered or slowly fade away? Once they're in the pulpit, they are carrying out their duties, uh, which include um, preparing sermons and reading Bible verses over and over again and going through the liturgy over and over again. And the more they do it, the more they see holes in it. And I'm not talking for all of them, of course, but you know, you, all of this repetition, they start thinking, hmm, I didn't really pay much attention to that in seminary, but now that I think about it more, this passage doesn't jive with this passage. And the more I read the Bible, I see there are more and more passages like that. So how can this be? And at the same time, you're trying to find interesting sermon topics because you've gone through you know, many years of the same seasons over and over again. Uh, you start reading other books and you find yourself reading books on uh, science and books on evolutionary psychology and books on neurology. And you find that there are better answers in there, more interesting stuff in there than you find in the, in the Bible and in religion books. And so as you're really trying to be a better pastor or trying to make the job more interesting to yourself and to your congregation, you start finding out things that don't fit into what you're supposed to do as a pastor. So it's like doing your job mm -hmm. starts to undo your job. Right. Could you speak a bit about your personal experience doing the project and then your personal experience writing the book? How how was it for you? How did it affect you personally, if I might ask? It was um, a, a very, um, in a way, unexpectedly um, deep experience with me, for me, to have these people open up so much. And uh, it's not as if it's the first time I've had that experience, but it was something that was so incredibly important to them. And, um, and I felt really honored. Um, to um, be in that situation, to be able to, to be with them and to be able to help them to express themselves. And as Dan pointed out, um, I think he noticed this more than I did, that they would, and many of them would say, oh, it's the first time I thought of that. Um, uh, you know, I've never said this to anyone else before. And uh, so it was, it was I, I felt very grateful to have had that experience. And I feel as if to the, to the extent that this can, I don't want to sound grandiose here, to the extent that this can change society, I will feel that I have been a part of something that I never expected to, to be a part of. And I, I think I know that a, a lot of people would just rather that I'd never done this study and it would go away. But I think even those people in the long run uh, will benefit from getting this kind of thing out in the open and, and making it possible for people to be honest about the most basic things. I mean, why can't you be honest about what you believe when what you're supposed to believe? I'm sorry, some of it is just so ridiculous. I think you have created a ripple effect. And, and I think it's not grandiose to say that you, you've had an impact. And I think uh, we'll, we'll continue to see it. And I suspect there will be people that we will never interview, never hear from, mm -hmm. who thought about going to seminary and read this book and it, it changed their lives. I, th I think we can count on that. I also noted, and maybe you and Dan took it for granted, but that both you and Dan are very revealing personally in the book. You, you tell your own personal story. Uh, Dan does too. So in some sense, you don't ask the subjects to do anything more than you're willing to do. And I think that's another lovely touch to the book. Your own personal experience comes out. Were you aware of that when you were writing it? We did that purposely. Uh, I felt that it was important 
uh, for um, the people reading the book to know where we were coming from. Uh, I, I know authors don't usually do that, but I felt that um, because the, uh, our participants have been so revealing, I felt that people reading the book would say, well, what about them? Mm -hmm. I also felt that a lot of people would say, well, they're just, you know, a couple of, you know, uh, uh, belligerent atheists who uh, were trying to show how idiotic these ministers were and that it was important for people to know that uh, what our background was or they couldn't make one up for themselves and decide what we were like in the absence of facts, which happens too often, mm -hmm. and that they knew that we had a religious background. I thought they would find that interesting. I, I particularly wanted to thank the uh, boys who shed their ickiness <laughs> and, and, and kept you from being a nun. And, uh, I don't know if you'd want to comment on that, but that's, again, a, a nice little personal touch in there that, that really is uh, uh, quite nice in reading the book. Well, thank you. I have, I have to say that uh, it was a very short-lived phase, and I do think that all Catholic girls go through it at some point, and it was not supported at all uh, at home. Nobody was impressed by the fact that I want to be a nun, and I personally want to thank my, my grade school boyfriend, Billy Brown, uh, for uh, keeping me from having any further thoughts about being a nun. Well, I'd like to thank him, too. I think we'd all like to thank him. Who were the individuals that made the biggest impression on you? You know, when I think about that, I think that um, that's very hard to answer because they all were so important to me. And I gave such individual attention to each one of them. So I think more in terms of what they were going through at the time. And there were two people who were actually in a transition process as they were interviewing them. And uh, one of them uh, was uh, a Mormon. And as you might know, Mormons um, don't have permanent clergy. They sign up essentially for five years, or they're asked to serve for five years. And they all have a, a profession of their own, and they go back to it. So they didn't have that tension of, of wondering what was going to happen to them if they lost their beliefs. So this Mormon um, became an agnostic while he was uh, a bishop, which is their equivalent to clergy. And, uh, and he went through terrible pain. He was one of the people who was in a deep depression because he was a fundamentalist. And his uh, wife was a devout Mormon. So his situation is not the best, but he knows it's going to be over in a couple of years. And he can go, he can continue with his profession. And to me, that was a, you know, another example of, wouldn't it be nice if you weren't stuck in this kind of situation? The other one was a military chaplain. And he, um, I interviewed him first by Skype in his overseas assignment. And this was a brilliant idea that Dan and I had, that we would get him in the midst of this, uh, of this uh, serious military situation. And then we'd do the other two interviews when he came home in a couple of months. Uh, and it worked out fine, but not the way we expected. Because it was a Skype call, and um, uh, he had uh, a lot of um, uh, serious things to discuss, it was very emotional, or at least it seemed emotional to me, but because it was a Skype call, you couldn't exactly tell if his voice was cracking or was actually the connection. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, we cut the call short, and, um, and then continued when he got home. And when he got home, he was thrilled. He was this whole different person because he was out of that bad situation and he was going to be leaving the military. He was a young guy, relatively speaking, compared to you and me. And uh, he was, had a second career all picked out. His wife was supportive. This is a guy I talked about earlier who, whose wife was not a believer in the first place. And she had a good job. And he was going to go on to another career. So it made me see the possibilities if people weren't stuck. And I guess I want to get that, that across. If people didn't feel stuck, these are people, these pastors, these ministers, these priests, these rabbis, have a lot to offer and can get very excited uh, if, if they just weren't stuck in this position. Could you talk some about depression and burnout with these individuals? Depression was very noticeable, not among everybody, but it's something that came up very frequently in the interviews, and of course I needed to be ready for that. 
Uh, I didn't really think about burnout very much until after the interviews were over, and one of the participants from the first study, his name is Mark Rutledge, and I can tell you his name because he has given interviews to news organizations himself as a participant in the study with his real name. Um, he sent me an article on burnout in the clergy, and as I read it, I thought, you know, this doesn't sound like the people that I interviewed, and why would they not be burned out? And the study did not uh, address depression. And so I went through the interviews, and I noted, and I remembered, of course, that some of them had been depressed, and uh, noted that none of them had burnt out. And burning out is just kind of getting tired of your work, so that you can't really perform very well anymore. But being depressed, will you tell us about depression? You're the psychiatrist. Being depressed is a much deeper thing. Well, the, the impression I had is that, that burnout is, as you said, people getting uh, worn down by the job mm -hmm. and taking care of people, pastoral counseling, mm -hmm. visiting people in the hospital, tending to people who can be in pain, mm -hmm. you can get burnout. Mm -hmm. But that these individuals that were depressed were caught in a very painful moral dilemma which seemed to really be unbearable for several of them. Mm -hmm. and, and that to me seemed to lead to the depression. And even in some cases, if I remember correctly, where they were getting suicidally depressed. Mm -hmm. And it, as you say, it was because of the, the moral situation they were in. And they um, came out of it in some cases, you know, the way anybody comes out of a depression with, uh, with medication and um, a period of time passing and psychotherapy. Many of them had, had psychotherapy. And, um, and I won't say this brought them out of the depression, but uh, becoming, uh, accepting the fact that they, no, they long, no longer believed and coming to terms with that and finding a way to incorporate that in their lives, whether that meant finding some way to leave the clergy or finding some way to stay in it, finding some way to accommodate that. Were you aware at moments that you were really functioning like a very good psychotherapist? I'd have to say yes, but when you say a, a psychotherapist, it, it, I think of a person helping people because when I was a psychotherapist, that's what I was doing. And I know very well from having conducted lots of market research interviews that you end up helping people even though that's not what you go in to do. Um, you go in to learn from them. And um, I prefaced every interview that I did by not only explaining them what the interview process was like, but to tell them that this was, this was an interview to learn from them and that I was not there as their counselor. And this interview was not psychotherapy. Um, uh, in the moments that seem like psychotherapy, I would say, yes, they do because I'm trained as a psychotherapist. But what they were was what I would like to think would be very good interviewing. And if it helped the person, that's wonderful. I'm happy to know it. Well, I think it did because one of the passages in the book really caught my attention because you could read it as a very good uh, psychotherapeutic intervention. Uh, one of the gentlemen was really struggling and you offered an interpretation and you could hear in his voice that he was relieved. Uh, it, it's indistinguishable from a very good psychotherapeutic intervention. And so it made me aware of that that was at moments certainly part of the process and if, if you were aware of it because it really comes through in the book. Well, I guess what I'm aware of is that uh, I was using all my skills. I was using every trick in the book that I had. And I, that I, uh, you know, as I said, I've done market research for many years. And that uh, I think it required uh, the knowledge that I had uh, recently acquired about religion. It uh, required uh, all of my, uh, the information I had about how to do a good uh, research interview, how to do good research, and everything I ever learned about psychotherapy. Could you say something about the phenomena that comes up several times about how these people in, in trying to cope with this make a distinction between fact and truth. A couple of them seem to try to do that as a coping mechanism. I think you will be talking about the liberal Protestants in that case. A truth would be uh, like a metaphorical truth like um, uh, the um, resurrection. It does not have to be the resuscitation of a corpse. I mean, I think you'll hear this in Episcopal churches all over the country. It's rebirth, it's springtime, it's uh, seeing yourself again in a new light. And that would be the truth of the resurrection, where the fact of the resurrection, you know, a dead body coming back, you know, let's not fool with that, that's ridiculous. And um, 
they will, even, they will say that, they won't say what I just said to the congregation, but they will speak in terms of the resurrection thinking to themselves and to some, to some extent to the congregation that there's a truth involved here. And it, it, it doesn't have to be uh, contaminated, as it were, with the facts. Yet they know that for many people, or some people in the congregation, mm -hmm. The resurrection and the resurrection of a, of a death coming back from death is mm -hmm. real. And, and essential. So in their minds, they think it's a metaphorical truth. Mm -hmm. They've shifted to that. They're preaching it that way, but they're having to be careful because they know they're members of the congregation that uh, would uh, mm -hmm. strongly disagree with them. Mm -hmm. And they know they're preaching to uh, you know, people at all different levels of belief. You, know, you may have people at a very similar level of education in, in a congregation, but they're at all different levels of belief. So they have to preach to them all um, to keep them all coming back and to, and to minister to them well, to serve them well. Linda, one of the things that struck me about this, if I understand it, is that one of the main problems is that they're stuck. They, they have disbelief, but they're stuck still leading a congregation and, and there's no employment out there for them otherwise, or at least they feel, and they're not trained to do anything else. But the, a lot of their pain is not just the disbelief, but that they're stuck. And it seems the implication is that if we as a society can come uh, up with or, or create ways to help these individuals transition, that would be in, in enormously beneficial to these people. Absolutely. and. Uh, uh, some of them have been able to do that for themselves. It's been extremely difficult, and it depends on what stage of life they're in. Um, something is happening through the clergy project, distinguished from the clergy study, which is a study that is completed, is that um, th there is outplacement assistance uh, through uh, the Stiefel um, Foundation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Todd Stiefel is a philanthropist, a humanist philanthropist, who is offering uh, uh, scholarships to help people write their resumes, to help clergy know how to go to interviews, to help them talk about their uh, clergy experience in a way that will uh, seem in translatable to other jobs. And a couple of people have already found uh, positions outside of the clergy through the help of this outplacement. It seems to me one of the other implications of your work and of this book would be that universities, people who run universities, should be aware of this population of individuals and that maybe create special scholarship programs because these are bright, educated people who want to further their education, want to find new ways of helping people. So yeah. it seems to me that Universities ought to come up. I mean, they're. In I the think. I think it's a fabulous idea. I think. I think it's. Um, I mean, universities are doing all sorts of new things now. And if they saw this as a as a new market, and if it were a new market, I mean, if there are enough clergy leaving or, or contacting universities, and, and with, they don't have to say anything about their lack of belief. Just say, I'm a mid career clergy. You know, I, I I'm looking for some way to, to leave this profession and get into another one. Uh, can you help me? What can you do for me? I think it's a wonderful idea. Well, and you remind me, a lot of universities do have mid-career programs. Right. And, and should we be trying to educate the administrators in these mm -hmm. mid-career programs that this is a potential group out here that really needs help? You know, a lot of them are trained as pastoral counselors. Mm -hmm. They could move into the mental health arena. Right. But I know uh, Richard Dawkins was trying to find a way to fund, to create monies to help these people transition. And it, and it just seems to me that institutions that are already helping people gain further education uh, could benefit this group of individuals. Mm -hmm. now, Let's do it. Yeah, we should do it. <laughs> I mean, now my bias here is that I'm at yeah. University of Virginia, Thomas right. Jefferson, who was probably a closet atheist mm -hmm. and a university dedicated to reason and science. I would love to see them have a program to, to help these clergy in transition. But that's, of course, wishful thinking on my part. One of the best things I like about this idea is that the clergy don't have to say, they don't have to come out of the closet and say they're non-believing. Because there's so many people who want to make some sort of a change in their career. And the churches supposedly are emptying out. I mean, the, all the, the uh, surveys and, and, um, and, and the clergy themselves will say this. 
uh, congregations are just uh, diminishing, uh, that it would seem obvious that there would be um, uh, a need for clergy to, uh, to re-up for different kinds of jobs. Thank you for watching, and again, thanks to Linda Lascola for being interviewed today. If you found this interesting, I cannot recommend highly enough Linda and Daniel Dennett's book, Caught in the Pulpit, Leaving Belief Behind. It is readily available in paperback or Kindle on Amazon. And I'd also like to thank our videographer, J.D. Mack. Thank you all.